Okay, so Robert is asking, if we get offended by someone who wronged us and then not get angry, is it still considered holding a grudge against someone else? Thanks, Robert. Great question. And um, this is definitely something again, where Christians don't do a great job speaking about these things a lot. And we just talk about it maybe in kind of esoteric terms at times in terms of forgiveness. But that kind of is the language that the Bible is going to give us. But let's take a deeper dive about why we sure shouldn't hold grudges and, and what all is part of this issue. Now, the Bible has sort of two main points that I, I think are important to stress. Number one, there is a general rule that God expects us to forgive as he forgives us. If we do not forgive others in our heart, it actually is a sign that we have not really internalized uh, that we ourselves are wretched sinners. Sorry. So we haven't internalized that we're wretched sinners if we're not forgiving people. And it means that we don't value God's forgiveness that he gave to us. And it may, uh, may be that we're not in fact repentant, and that's totally going to get in the way then of us being forgiven. And most of all, let us not forget that God is love, and we're called to love others out of gratitude as God has loved us. So that's kind of like one, one sort of nugget there. Think of why God's calling us to forgive. It's even for our own good. Secondly, uh, there's a corollary to it, which is also in our own good, which is that holding on to anger, keeping a grudge, or otherwise refusing to forgive somebody is a mentality that will lead us back into sin. So not only do we have the issue of, of you know, us not being forgiven for past sins, but if we don't hold, if, if we don't forgive and we hold on to a grudge, that could make us end up doing new sin. Because it gives Satan this opening into our lives to tempt us and drives a, a wedge between us and the other person and even between us and God. So now that I've sort of given this outline of these two things, one, it makes it, it hard for us to be forgiven. And then second, it's going to cause us to sin. Let's now look at the Bible verses on these two concepts. So number one, uh, let's start off with the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, it's a story where Jesus talks about how there was this servant who was owed who owed his master ten thousand talents, and this is a mind-boggling amount of money for back then. That there was no hope he would ever in his lifetime be able to make that amount. That's that's how Jesus uh, sort of framed it. And then he had a fellow servant who owed him, um, you know, like a hundred denarii, which was just a pittance compared to what he had owed, and. The master forgave the first servant who owed the ton of money. But then he turns around and finds the servant that owed him just like a few bucks. And he laid his hands on him, took him by the throat and said, pay me what you, what you owe me. You know, <laughs> he's getting even violent and then threw him into debtor's prison until he could pay the debt. Like extreme. And, and, and then we pick up with Matthew 18 at verse 32. So Matthew 18, verse 32. And this is Jesus speaking the story. He says, then his master, uh, referring to the, the master of the original servant who was paid a ton of money, um, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt, you, th all of the debt because you begged me. You sh should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant? just as I had pity on you. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So the question here is, you know, okay, why is Jesus telling us? What, what does he want to get out of this? Well, who's that master? Who's he a stand-in for? And, and Jesus explains in Matthew 18, verse 35, he says, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So we, we have no idea, no comprehension of just how bad our sins are and how much harm it, they're doing to other people, how it's indirectly hurting God. And, but God is you know, readily willing to forgive these huge sins we do. 
And yet we have someone who might do one little wrong to us and we might hold a grudge and, and make a big deal out of it and not want to forgive them. And, and it almost makes a mockery of God's forgiveness, right? And again, it's showing we don't really comprehend sins. We don't understand our, our sinfulness. And it's going to put us in a, a very perilous state uh, spiritually when it comes to, comes to the nature of forgiveness. And we, we could take a look now at, at Matthew 18, verses uh, 21 to 22. Which, uh, this is earlier in the story, actually. Um, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall my, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus says to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 77 times times sorry 70 times seven this is a huge number um and that's not a random number uh, you know seven is a number of complete completeness and here it's 70 so seven times 10 times seven and that's also adds up to 490 which is exactly the period of time that god gave the the jews to rehabilitate to you know come into and and confirm the covenant with God after the return from Babylon. He gave them 490 years. And even still, after that period of time, God was still willing to forgive any Jews who would repent and turn to him, as we see with the, the New Testament church. So basically, Jesus is saying, Jesus saying, just always forgive, be willing to forgive when, when that person comes to you and, and is repentant. And, and I want to emphasize that part is repentance. So 32 it says, Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgive you all your debts because you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Don't need to read that part. But verse 22 it says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven, seven times, but up to 77. Um, and then there's a similar parallel verse to this Luke 17, 3 to 7. Jesus says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, if he repents, forgive him. And I'm not emphasizing this to say, if only someone repents to you, do you forgive them? I'm saying that this is a key condition even for you to be forgiven with God. Um, verse four, it says, and if he sins against you seven times, yeah, then we, we see the 77. So God is really, really emphasizing repentance, forgiveness, do to others as you have had done to you. Now, let's see what the Bible says about forgiving to not sin. Proverbs 3, verses 33. Uh, we see there that it reads, For churning of milk produces butter, or, uh, and pressing the nose brings forth blood, so the churning of anger produces strife. So churning of anger, you know, just letting it simmer, let it cook, letting it persist will lead to strife. Uh, you know, pain, hardship, conflict, these sorts of things. It's very much the opposite that we have with love. And, and we see in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, love is not easily angered and it keeps no records of wrong. So it's forgiving, it's letting things in the past be in the past. This is how God wants us to be. The law of God that he's given us to follow is the law of love. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. It goes beyond into the realms like this. We're being called to forgive. And, and if you don't believe me that you know, harboring anger actually can lead to sin, if not be sin itself, we see in Matthew 5, verse 22, Jesus says, and I'm reading from the NASB version on this, says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the, the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. And, you know, it might take some time to unpack this verse, but, you know, the emphasis here is anger. Jesus says, if you're an angry person, you're harboring anger, you're angry at everybody, you probably do not have the character, the, the, the mindset, the, the spirit within you that actually is reflective of a person who has been saved. And, and, and in fact, that anger is, is and harboring it and, and letting it carry you away is sin. And Ephesians 4, 
26 to 27. I'm reading from the from the NIV. Again, the NIV is a little bit better with this one. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Like, so here's he's emphasizing. You know, Paul is emphasizing if you are harboring that anger, you're giving an opening, a door to your soul where Satan can really tempt you to do bad things. And, and maybe it would cause you to sin a couple times, but worse, he can totally cause you to walk away from God, walk away from a church, walk away from a community, people you need, relationships that would do you good. Satan can use that anger to manipulate you in a sense. And so let's close with this thought. Uh, Ephesians 4, starting at verse 30. Ephesians 4, verse 30, and we're back to the NKJV. It reads, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So, you know, the Holy Spirit is always working in our hearts, trying to bring us into a state of love. So Paul says, don't grieve it. Don't, or grow, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Like, I think that's just a perfect summary of like what all we discussed. This is how we are supposed to live, how God wants us to be. And that's just a beautiful thought there. So I hope this is helpful for you. I'm sorry to hear that you've been wrong, that you know you feel the anger. But maybe, Wendy, would you like to share a little bit about your favorite quote about forgiveness? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, there's a, a quote. Um, this is from Dick Tibbetts. He's the, he has a book on Forgive to Live, which I think is a great book and resource on this topic. Um, and he says that failing to forgive is like taking a poison pill and hoping the other person dies. It, it doesn't work that way. Our, our choice to forgive is for our health and well-being. God wants us to forgive because it brings us healing and restoration. And it also happens to help the relationship, it help the other person as well, but it's primarily for us and our benefit. And so um, I also want to share one key thing here also that forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. In our culture today, most people confuse forgiveness with reconciliation. They are not the same thing. Forgiveness has to occur before reconciliation can occur. But forgiveness in and of itself does not bring about reconciliation. Forgiveness is you've moved past what they've done to you. You're, you've let go of it. Let go of yeah, it. yeah. Whereas before reconciliation can occur, which there is has the restoring to, of the relationship. Right. There has to be trust established. And trust has to be earned in a relationship once it's broken. It has to be restored. And so forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. So I, I just want people to understand that if they're struggling with forgiveness, thinking that they have to reconcile, that is not what God is saying. That's a great point. And then uh, Rachel has a has a vo uh, a great verse, First Peter four eight. Maybe Wendy. Sure. Uh, Therefore, be self controlled and sober minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Yeah, uh, great verse. Thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. And Tina, did you have thoughts, comments? Yeah, and I just um, was, you know, thinking about this. I, I was just going to say, like, yeah, I, I really like the verse that Rachel shared as well, because that's a really powerful verse. Um, but, you know, I guess going back to the original question, I, I'm kind of picking it apart. I guess I don't know if I'm picking it apart more than I need to. He's like, if we get offended by someone who wronged us and then not get angry, is it still considered holding a grudge? So he's like, I got offended, but I didn't, you know, I didn't get angry. I didn't harbor anger. Um, you know, is it wrong to get offended? And I guess like that 
to me, it goes back to that verse in Ephesians four that says, you know, to be angry and sin not. Um, I think sometimes, you know, it's not wrong to have righteous indignation. Like if somebody gave me the finger on the freeway or something, I would, I would be offended because I'm like, that's an inappropriate gesture. I don't want my kids to see that. That's not okay. Um, you don't do that. You know, I wouldn't like it. I would be offended by that. But would I be angry at that person? No, I'd feel bad for them that they are in a state that they feel that upset that they need to do that. So, you know, I would forgive them and let it go. But my being offended by it, I don't think that's wrong because it's a bad thing that they did. So, um, yeah, I and that's also, and so that's I'm, why I didn't go into it because I, I agree with you. But it's like, what does offended mean? And it gets into the subjective yeah. realm where the Bible doesn't really go either, right? And yeah. and even yeah. Jesus talks about like he would offend people. So even not all offense is wrong. Yeah, no, um, definitely. You know, we're the salt of the earth, and salt can irritate. <laughs> <laughs> if you're yeah. salt on a wound, salt in your eye, you know, that, and that, and that is true. And, you know, I sometimes have said, I believe in Jesus and people are offended that I say that. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry that offends you, but you know, this is my stance. And so, you know, um, I'm just talking about, you know, you being personally offended. If you become offended by something that somebody does, like things can be offensive, things can upset you and it's okay to be upset by bad things, but it's what you do with that is what, which way it goes. If it's like, I'm going to get back at them and you know, hold a grudge or be angry and whatever. Yeah, that's the wrong way. But if you're like, I didn't like that, but you know what? I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to let it go. And I'm going to try my best to not copy that <laughs> behavior. And I'm going to, you know, see if there's something I need to do to not cause somebody else to do that. But, um, and maybe also just be like, you know, this is a person that you know, reacts negatively. Maybe I need to avoid this kind of person as well. So I'm just saying um, that's kind of my take on that because I've had situations kind of that have happened that way. I'm like, because it's hard to know kind of what you do with your feelings sometimes. And you mm -hmm. really have to keep, I, that's why I like that for verse in first Peter four, eight that Rachel shared, because to be self-controlled, to be in control of your emotions, not to let them run free. Cause it's very easy to you know, let your anger flare up. Like, yeah. trust me, I get it. <laughs> like, I'm a Latina. <laughs> like, we, you get angry, but um, you know, we have to keep those things in control and you know, you know, mentally put them where they need to go. You know, Lord, take away my anger, help me forgive, and um, you know, just kind of work, work, let help God, um, let God help you <laughs> through. Yeah, that's a good point. Feeling. I'm sorry. That, and that's a good point that we always try to emphasize here, right? That you can't always do these things in of your own strength and really mm -hmm. let God, take it, give it to God, cast yeah. your cares on him, take your anger and just throw that as far away as you can to at his feet. Yeah, amen. And I know there's so many amazing people out there who've had anger issues and who God has helped them through it. Mm -hmm.